For most of you, this video should be a refresher from last year. So by the end of this video, you should be able to calculate the components of a vector that was expressed as a magnitude and angle, and also be able to do the opposite. Apply Newton's first law, sum of forces equal to zero, to a non armed force needed to find uh, to obtain equilibrium. You should be able to define what unit vectors are and express a force vector using the unit vector notation. So let's use an example to explore these ideas. Here we have a crate that is on the ground. We're looking at it from above, so that's the top view. There are two forces that are acting on the crate, both of 40 Newton. The question is what the force is required to keep the object at rest. So imagine there is no friction and what third force would we have to put? So in order to get equilibrium, the idea is that we need to make sure that the sum of all the forces that are acting on the object is equal to zero. This is Newton's first law. So we have to find what third force to apply in order that the sum of forces will be equal to zero. To get there, there's really two main or category of approach that we can take. The first one is a graphical approach where we would use the vector arrows and draw them to scale so that we can try to find out uh, by drawing it what would happen. And the second approach is by using components. So let's go quickly through both of these. In the graphical approach, what we want to do is to just take each of the vector that we have and add them tip to tail. So here I have my vector f1, my vector f2 will look something like that. Okay, they have to be the same length because they are both 40 newtons, but the angle will be different. Maybe my angle is not quite large enough in here, so something like this. And what we want to do is to put them tip to tail. So I don't know if you recall to do this, but the idea is that you start with the first vector and then you put the second vector just to continue it in some sense. And what we want to do if the third force is to bring the sum of force back uh, to zero is that the third force should be a force that will start at the end of the third vector and bring us back to the first one so that in total, the sum of all the forces will be equal to zero. So in here, that would be my force F3, all right? If you do this graphically by on a scale paper with all the angles right, you could actually find F3 right away by doing this. However, it's not always practical. So what we will do instead is we will use a component approach. What this means is that we will start with our vector F3 and actually what we'll be looking for instead are the x and y component of this vector. And these components we'll find from different equations. So this is the method I want to show you next. So to achieve this, let's focus on the drawing once again. So we have f1 and f2, and we just found out that f3 will be roughly in this direction. I don't know where exactly, but I know it will be somewhere there. What I want to do is to make the problem a little bit more abstract. So the fact that it's a crate and not a ball or something else is not super important. So we want to reproduce all the forces on something called a free body diagram, all right? So we'll discuss these a little bit later in the semester, but for now, it's just essentially starting your forces all at the origin. So I know that my F3 will be somewhere here, and we already discussed that we would have F1 right on the axis. And finally, we have F2 that is at an angle in here. Maybe that's not large enough. Okay, so something like this. Okay, keep track of your angles. So I know that the angle in here will be 30 degrees. Okay, and this is just the new format, if you want, of the problem. That's what we'll be working with. And now we want to use this diagram in here to focus on what's going on on the x-axis and what's going on on the y-axis separately. The first problem we get is that F2 is in diagonal here, so we need to break it up. So that's the next step, is to decompose the vector F2 into its x and its y component. This is not super difficult, but maybe it requires a refresher. So F2 we know was as a strength of 40 newtons. So what we want to do is just to take this vector represented as 40 newton at 30 degree uh, above the negative x-axis 
and transform it into the component of the vector f2. So we want to find what are f2x and f2y. So in order to do this, I think the best way is to first draw a small box around your vector. Okay. That box should always have one edge or one end on the origin and the other, the end of the diagonal at the other end of the box. The best way to decompose your vector without messing up, I think, is to first draw a rectangle around your vector. So the rectangle should always have sides parallel to the x and y axis, one edge that will be at the origin, and the diagonal should be your vector, all right? If you do it this way, then the side that is parallel to the y-axis in here and the side that is parallel to the x-axis in here will automatically become your x and y component. So this will be f3y and this will be f3x. After that, it's just a question of this good old friend Sokatoa. All right, so you remember Sokatoa. So we have... I like to write it this way, but it's super visual, all right? So sine is the function that is described by the opposite side of the triangle over the hypotenuse, cosine adjacent side over hypotenuse, and tangent opposite side over the adjacent side. So you can look at this, and you see that we have an angle of 30 degrees, and we know that the x component in here is adjacent to the angle. So when we'll try to find f2x, what we will do is just to take the magnitude of the vector, I'll call it just f2 for now, times the cosine of the angle of 30 degrees, okay? Because f3 is adjacent to the angle. And in here, f2 we know is equal to 40 newtons times the cosine of 30 degrees, and I'll let you finish the calculation if needed. Then we can do the same thing for f2y, and when you get f2y, we have now a force that is in here. So you see that if we think of the rectangle, I can also redraw f3y in here if I prefer, right? It's the exact same thing. So we know that it's the opposite side of our triangle. So f3y is opposite to the angle, and because it's opposite to the angle, we know we have to use the sine to do it. So we'll get f2 times the sine of 30 degrees, which will be equal to 40 newtons times the sine of 30 degrees. All right, so with this, we have both our values. So we are now ready to apply the equilibrium condition. So we go back to the diagram, and we now know that we have an F2 component that is vertical in here, F2y, and we also have an F2 component that is horizontal, F2x, and these two components together replace F2. So I'll just put some lines on top of F2 to remind us that it's already been taken care of. And then we can do the same trick for F3. So I'll do it with a different color to make it clearer. So for my F3, I will have one part of my force, one component, F3y, which will be in this direction. And then I will have F3x that will be in this direction. Again, you can always draw your box around the vector if you don't want to mess it up. So we have our two components in here. And next trick, and this is what's super important, is you want to focus on each axis independently. So if we start with the x-axis, we know that in order to be in equilibrium, the sum of force must be equal to zero. Sum of force, a typical way to write it, is just sum of forces on the x-axis will be equal to zero. And this big symbol in here, sigma, just means the sum. So in here, what are the force acting on the x-axis? Well, there's F1 that is pointing forward, so I'll take it as a positive value, so plus F1. And then you see that on the negative side of the axis, I have two contribution, F2x, so I have F2x in here, and also there will be F3x. 
but both of these are pointing in the negative direction. So that's why I want to add negative sign in front. So what I get in the end is my equation is that f1 minus f2x minus f3x will be equal to zero. And that's the equation that we will use. So from that, you can see easily if I just add a zero in here, we can isolate f3x, which means just bringing it on the other side. So we'll have f3x is equal to f1 minus f2x. That's it, right? And we can always already plug values in there if we want to. We know that f1 is 40 newtons, and we know that f2 was 40 newtons cosine 30 degrees, all right? And if you do these calculations, you can show, you can find that the answer will just be equal to minus, I'm sorry, plus five point, and if I round it, four newtons, all right? So that's the contribution on the x-axis. You see it's this very small number, just as we see here. And then we can repeat exactly the same thing for the y-axis. So sum of force on the y-axis is equal to zero. So again, I focus just on the y-axis. So on the positive side, I have f2y, so plus f2y. And on the negative side, I have f3y, so this will be minus f3y. And once again, we know that this is equal to zero, which means that f3y will just be equal to f2y, which was equal to 40 newton times the sine of 30 degrees. So this will just be 20 newtons. And we have our components for both the x and the y axis. At this stage, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that we considered f2x to be a positive number, even though it's pointing in the negative direction. I will do this for all components. My components always assume they are positive, and then the direction is really given from the diagram, so the diagram will be super important. And the key is that when you write your sum of force equation, whatever component was pointing in the negative direction, you want to make sure that you add a little negative sign in front of it, okay? So this is where we'll treat, uh, keep track, I'm sorry, of the directions. Uh, with my experience of teaching, I think that doing it this way is reducing the chances that you'll be, sign, you'll be making sign mistakes in your calculations. So we now have the components of our vector F3. So F3x is equal to 5.4 Newton in the negative x direction, which we can, if we want, just rewrite as minus 5.4 Newtons. And we have f3y, which is equal to 20 newtons in the negative direction, y direction, which we could also write just simply as minus 20 newton on the y-axis. If we want to find the magnitude and direction of the angle of the vector, we can uh, simply do it by using for finding the magnitude. It will just be by using Pythagoras, as I am convinced you've done before. Okay, so we want to use Pythagoras theorem. So in here, it's just stating that F3 will be equal to the square root of F3x squared plus F3y squared. So you just take the components, square them, and then take the square root, and this will give you the magnitude. Magnitude, always positive, by the way. And to find the direction, another word that we use often just to mean angle, okay the best way is to always find your angle from the x-axis okay so in here i will find the angle in here so that will be the angle i'll be looking for theta 3. so we can see that we have the components already and that the f3y is opposite to the angle while f3x is adjacent so the trig function that can help us out help us in here is that the tangent of theta 3 will be equal just to the ratio of f3y over f3x okay and if we do this in here we get we get 74.9 degrees and now you have to be careful about how you express it you have multiple possibilities you could say 74.9 degrees below the negative uh, negative 
x-axis. That would be one way. You could also count from the beginning. So this would mean you could also say that it's 74.9 degrees plus 180 degree, which is just the classic way of doing things. So this would be just 254.9 degrees. So this is uh, understood to be from the positive x-axis. Or you could also write it as a negative angle. So finding the angle that is missing in here. To do this in here, we could simply do 74.9 degrees minus 180 degrees. And this will give us minus 105.1 degrees. So all three methods are totally okay to describe your vector. So to summarize, we can express the vector by using magnitude and direction. So here, 20.7 Newton at 74.9 degrees below the negative x-axis, this being the result of the calculation on the previous page. We can express it also with x and y components, f3x, f3y. There's another way in which we can express it that is similar to the components method, but just a little bit uh, nicer, that is used a lot in math and in physics. And it seems a bit maybe scary at first, but it's really not that bad, okay? So what we can do is we can say, okay, we have 5.4 Newton in negative x direction. So this actually I can rewrite as 5.4 Newton in the negative x direction. I will replace this just by minus i hat, okay? And then same thing for y, we have the 20 Newton, so 20 Newton in the negative y direction, that will be negative j hat which I can rewrite afterward if I prefer just as minus 5.4 Newton i hat plus, or if you prefer right away minus, it doesn't matter, minus 20 Newton j hat. Okay, this is something called a notation that is called unit vectors. Okay, the i hat just replace in the direction of x and the y hat is just replace in the direction of x. Okay, so unit vectors, what they are, uh, for us, it will be super simple, okay? They are always vectors with magnitude of 1, and they are used to represent just a direction. We note them with a caret over a ladder. For us, we will use them just to represent the x and the y axis. So i hat, some textbook will also use j hat, uh, x hat, I'm sorry, instead, means in the x direction, and j hat or y hat means in the y direction. So that's it for this clip. You're now able to decompose vector, recompose vectors, and use them to find uh, the force needed to keep equilibrium for a system. Thanks.